And then next, I'd like to introduce um, the person that's co-chair of the uh, programs. He's also a retired Brigadier General. He is a pastor at Lely Presbyterian Church. And he is the, a board member. But most importantly, he's the guy that takes the pictures at our stuff. That's Ed Brent to introduce our speaker. Russell, thank you so much. I'm also the guy who didn't put any product on my hair when I got out of the shower today. So I got this first thing happening here. Uh, we, we are so thrilled to have you today, Steve, as our speaker. I know you were here with a salute to veterans, and you inspired and made people think about things in ways we never thought of. So pardon me for reading your bio, but I will let this be the introduction for you. And I think all of you will truly appreciate what he has to say and the perspectives that he brings. Steve Quas is the Chief Executive Officer of Sky Corp Incorporated, a company pioneering future sustainable space construction and economic development. Born in California, southern or northern? Not my fault. Not your fault, okay. <laughs> he was raised in a remote African tribe. I want to hear more about that. Moved back to the U.S. and graduated from the, the United States Air Force Academy. Phoenix Military Academy? <laughs> <laughs> <Can I start? laughs> I am so sorry for opening that can of worms. It's my, my apologies. His military career spanned every major combat operation from a young lieutenant fighter pilot in Desert Storm, culminating as the commanding Air Force General at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Thank you so much for your service for doing that. And so Steve consequently, subsequently rose to the highest levels of command in the United States Air Force. He has a master's degree from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and Public Policy. He's been a university president and the president of the number one startup company in America. And probably the best thing about his life is that he's married to the former Joni McDonough, and they have two children. Please join me in welcoming Steve Quast. And I'd like to kind of start, though, by just reminding us of where we're at. We, we are living in a time where, regardless of what element of our society you look at, there's a cause for concern. But this is not going to be a presentation that uh, is talking about the problem as much as it's going to be talking about the reason so that we can do something to solve it. And the title of this, if you saw it, was Saving America, how the space economy can revitalize this beacon on the hill that stands for the beliefs and the values that everybody on the planet flocks to belong to. There's something about that. And I will tell you that what I'm going to do is just give you a quick snapshot of what I think is going on based on my years of studying human nature, studying geopolitics, studying technology, and then studying economics. Uh, because what we see taking place in the world is not new. This has played out a thousand times before whether it was the Babylonian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Roman Empire, you name it, these dynamics are the same. And we're going to talk about some things in the news even today and over the last few weeks that are iconic examples of a symptom of a much deeper underlying condition of what's happening around our world and within our society. And why this club right here and other clubs that are uh, joining us that represent people with that fighting American spirit, uh, there's something important for you to take away from this. And it's not just being motivated to do something, it's being motivated to do something that actually makes a difference in, in turning this tide. So what I'd like to do is start by just uh, reminding everybody that the reason we are sitting in such a beautiful city with such beautiful people is because of our Constitution. That Constitution is so unique in the history of mankind because it is rooted in the principles that have been laid out in the Bible and laid out with this proposition that we are one nation under God. Amen. Without a belief system that is founded in what human nature is really all about, 
informed by our creator. If we don't believe the right things, then we don't have the right values and we write the wrong policies that start degrading what good men and women have built. And so all of you in this room, all of us in this room, have lived our entire lives in somewhat of a cocoon. It has been an anomaly of history where America has been so unilaterally dominant, economically, culturally, politically, militarily, that we have been able to relax and enjoy this freedom, this liberty, this self-sufficiency, the privacy that comes with the American life, and be less and less concerned on whether the government is doing its job and abiding by these principles in our Constitution. And this happens with every civilization, to one degree or another. This reality, though, that all civilizations are born in the vigor and the recognition that you have to fight for your freedom, and they recognize the need for security and strength. And then every generation that comes after that, that grows up in a comfortable environment which, with many creature comforts and with no requirement to fight anybody over anything, to never have to stand firm on a belief or a value, or never even have to really pick a fight or take risk at upsetting anybody because you could just kind of go along to get along, that that is just part of the human condition. The human condition tends to take the easiest route, tends to not want conflict. But that is not the road to survival, and that is not the road to security. And this has been something we've been reminded of. Thomas Jefferson reminded us of this, saying, if you give up your liberty for a desperate desire for security, you will get neither, and you will deserve neither. But he was really actually quoting God, as Moses was asking God, as he was looking at Canaan and bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. He said, how do we go in with our people and live in a land where they don't believe in God? And the answer was pretty clear and something that I'll touch on at the end of this discussion. But it was pretty simple. Teach your children to love their God. And somewhere along the way, we have just given that responsibility to the government, and we have not necessarily been checking their homework. And now we have a generation of people who are brighter, smarter, stronger, more capable than any generation before, because this is part of human nature and how God created his people. And that is every generation builds on the shoulders of the last generation, and they do it better, smarter, faster. Just look at that five-year-old kid that knows how to work any smart device better, faster, and smarter than you could. It's because they're natives. And it's because they built their knowledge base and their cognitive habits based on everything that our generation built. So this starts begging the question of um, how do we take this back? And before we get to the root issue, and that is teaching the next generation the beliefs and the values that are consistent with human nature and one nation under God. It's important to overlay on this conversation that helps describe some of the crazy things you see going on, such as that balloon that floated across America the other day, that this conversation about our values and teaching our children how to live in a land where God is not taught to be loved, consistent with the Bible and consistent with our Constitution, is that we are not in a vacuum or a bubble. We have other civilizations out there that are in a competition for the top dog. And if we want to be the shining beacon on a hill, we need to recognize that everybody that is not that top dog on the top of that hill is gunning for us, and they want to take us down. And Satan works in that space. And if you think that national security is about having better planes, ships, tanks, and submarines than your adversary, you're dead wrong. National security is about having the power 
to defend your values and your beliefs. And if you do it right, you create an economy that is so powerful that it's the second and third order effects of the tanks and the ships, the planes, and all the other things that uh, make you powerful that your enemy stays at bay. But when you are weak, your enemies will go after your, your juggler. So we are watching two dynamics unfold. The first is the degradation of the moral soul of America that was born in this vigor, understanding the need to fight, to work hard, to build an economy, and to teach our children the right values, overlaid with the degradation of that value structure, generation after generation slowly, with an adversary that is very clever and has a strategy that takes advantages of our strengths. Our strengths are that we talk to one another, that we are innovative, that we have an open society, that we have an open market. Our adversaries know that, and they are slowly and insidiously gaining control of some of the major elements that make our country powerful economically. So I'll start with the economic conversation, and then we, again, we're going to end on the education, because that really comes to the bottom line. So I'll just, I'll just use what's in the paper even today. You know, one of the articles that came out in the last couple of days that's making its way around is uh, that China now dominates 37 of the 44 most important economic foundations of the modern economy. We're talking about things like defense technology, space technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, quantum, uh, biomedical, and pharmaceuticals. We're talking about things like drones, solar panels, environmental law, environmental technology. China has, for many years, articulated a vision that most of you may not even know, because not many of us know Mandarin, and not many of us will read the documents that get translated into English that reveal every speech, every document, and every dollar spent in China on this vision. But let me put it into black and white terms for you. After studying China for the last 35 years on all of these fronts, the cultural front, the economic front, the military front, the technological front, China has dedicated their national visit, vision to dominating the global economy by 2049 using space as the primary high ground of geographic and electromagnetic dominance to dominate the information domain, the narrative domain, the energy domain, and the transportation domain. And how they plan on doing it is taking advantage of our vulnerabilities. And we have a number of vulnerabilities. The first is that we are dependent on electronics. And those electronics are not hardened. They are not built to be resilient. They're built to function, and they're built on an economic model of effectiveness and return on investment. Nobody in a million years thought that if they built you a, a water valve that delivers water to your house that is aligned with GPS timing to be able to turn on and turn off properly and to operate properly, and it's reliant on this GPS signal, and it's reliant on a, a circuit board with electrons flowing through it that are not protected from any kind of electromagnetic pulse or any kind of weapon that might stop the electrons from one running. They never thought in a million years somebody would be within our continental United States attacking our critical infrastructure. So this gets back to the, um, the, the, the important understanding of China's strategy. China's strategy does not want to fight. They do not want to go up against us toe-to-toe -to -toe against our tanks, our ships, our planes, our satellites. We still build the best equipment on the planet, and it's because we're innovative, and we have an open society in academia and in industry. But China knows something that most great military leaders know as well, and that is amateurs talk about weapons and tactics. They like the shiny object of the airplane, the tank, the submarine. Professionals talk about logistics. Because ultimately, every competition is a long-term battle to see who can outlast the other when it comes to values. Because if I have a gun 
or if my adversary has a bigger gun, they can make me go away, or they can make me be quiet. But they don't change my values. They don't change my beliefs. And when I have enough power to be able to live my beliefs, then I will throw off the shackle of that threat, of that person that's trying to bully me, or to make me believe something I do not believe. So let me give you a few examples of how China, over the last 30 plus years, has slowly uh, weaseled their way into our society. And one of the reasons we cannot paint a holistic picture of what has gone on there is because we live in silos. We live in a silo of Naples. We live in a silo of Florida. We live in a silo of the energy market, the information market, the transportation market. We live in silos, primarily because optimization of the economy of that silo is accentuated when you have the experts designing within a certain space and they can make the most brilliant smartphone or the most brilliant generator or the most brilliant light bulb. So there are good reasons why we have silos. It also allows us to live our constitutional freedoms where you live in a state and the power is distributed down to the individual through the states. It's not the federal government that should have the power. It's the people that should have the power. And that has insidiously been swept up to the federal level over decades. And it's going to be tough to take it back. So China knows this. So if you were to map, and I'll just use uh, a several examples. If you were to map what China has done to infiltrate our laboratories, and these are our federally funded laboratories like Sandia Lab, Lincoln Lab, that are associated with great universities, San, no, Livermore Labs, what they have done to bring in engineers, scientists, money into those labs has created an incredible industrial espionage of some of our greatest secrets into China. And we see those secrets coming back. It's no mistake that their greatest fighter aircraft looks like an F-22. It's no mistake that their aircraft carrier looks like our aircraft carrier. It's no mistake that their tanks and their ships look like our tanks and our ships. They may not be as good at getting the job done, but numbers has a quality all its own, and they're building them like they're going out of business. That's just the laboratories. Let's talk about the economy. Guess who the largest owner is of the agricultural enterprise in America? China. And guess who's number two? Bill Gates, okay? And I'm gonna draw a line between these examples I'm giving you because it's all about logistics and it's all about the power of technology. Let's take another one, let's take uh, law, okay? Legal documents. If you take a look at what China has done to shape the legal environment, it's not only the United Nations documents that are kind of international documents that try to bring in this global idea that we just need one government, well, you know, if one government in America is good, why not one government for the entire globe? Where the individual beliefs of every person on this planet that are diverse and different for a reason become subjugated to a global, global government that wants you all to believe the exact same thing. It's a way of controlling people, and it's something we have to watch for. Let me take another one for you, and that's the energy market. If you take a look at the energy market and how much China has gobbled up the technologies, uh, the land, the power plants, they're on the board of directors, they are investors in these companies, because again, we're a free and open society. So there's nothing to say that a CEO of a company cannot take investor money from somebody who's been given that money by a multi-billionaire in China who is beholden to the Central Communist Party. And it happens all the time. And believe me, I've seen it with my company. As a space startup, I, tur I, I turned away $500 million because it was coming from China. And all they wanted was our intellectual property, which is what's going to make America the powerhouse manufacturer of the space economy. Now, the last time I was here, I talked about why we needed a space force. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to bring one other up, one other example. And that's agriculture. I've talked about energy. I've talked about transportation. I've talked about information is the one I want to talk about just a little bit. And this, this includes um, our education. The Confucius centers that are at many of our institutions of higher learning. 
And when you map the board of visitors or the board of directors or the board of advisors for universities and who is giving the money, I first encountered this insidious influence of Chinese money on higher education, on what the professors are allowed to publish or not publish, the insidious nature of how they are in the influence of big media, Hollywood, Disney, all of these stories that we are telling our children and telling ourselves are influenced by a bias that is becoming more and more visible. The last Top Gun movie, the Maverick movie that many of you may have watched, they had to change that movie because there was a patch on Maverick's fighter pilot leather jacket that uh, talked about Taiwan. And China didn't like it, and they were able to bully the movie to reshoot the scenes and get rid of any image that would give any credence to the fact that Taiwan had any sense of independence. Colleagues of mine and myself have tried to get articles published in some of the main media about what is really going on with regard to this global competition between great powers like China and America on all of these insidious areas. And they are rejected out of hand. Rejected out of hand. Not because the journalist doesn't want to write it, but because their chain of command, their bosses, look at it as a threat to the money coming in from China that is paying the bills. And so I, I had a number of journalist friends that would, re, they would get so angry when I would reveal this um, understanding over years of observation and mapping the money until a number of them retired and became freelance journalists and then said, okay, I'll show you that these journalists are independent. That they can publish anything they want. If they believe the story is true and important, they will publish it. And to date, none of them have published any of them. And these journalists now realize what they were in. They were in a system that made them believe they had independence, but when they mapped what was given permission to print, they could only print what fit the ideological worldview of the people in charge that were influenced by money from China. And so it's no wonder the true story doesn't get told. That balloon that floated across America, let me tell you the story about that, and that's what I spent most of my time on the last time I was here about why we needed a spaceport. And I will tell you that this idea is as important as this country arguing in the early days in the Federalist Papers over whether we should have a Navy or not have a Navy, whether we should have a standing army or not a standing army, whether we should have an Air Force or not an Air Force. If, we, if President Trump had not intervened and put up with all the bullying, the sarcasm, the ridicule, and the humiliation he had to endure to put in a wedge in history, a law that says we have a space force, had he not done that, we would not have any options in the future to fight what is coming. So that balloon revealed something that every American should be alarmed at. And that is that all of our sensors, all of our shooters to protect our country are optimized to industrial age threats of a, a bygone era. They are not designed for what we can do in the electromagnetic spectrum and what China does to work in the gray zone. What China was doing and had been doing for a long time is hiding in the sport ballooning path. There's a lot of sport ballooners out there and a lot of people that will use the jet stream to carry balloons above where any aircraft fly so there's no safety problem. And they will just gently and peacefully float around the world and win all kinds of records and do all kinds of cool things that Americans and, and pioneers like to do. Be the first to circle the globe, be the fastest, be the highest. And China was hiding within that ecosystem of sport ballooning because we weren't even paying attention, nor did we care, nor did we really know what to look for. Or now, as soon as somebody rang an alarm bell, then all the sensors started getting retweaked to figure out what was going on. That same phenomenon of burying our head in the sand, assuming that everything will be like it always has been, and that because America has been powerful and strong and secure since World War II, we will be powerful and strong and secure going forward. 
The military asks for just a better tank, incremental innovation, a better plane, slightly better stealth, when our adversaries are designing things that make all of that investment irrelevant unless we are there with them. So even though, in my view, a space force has been created and it is an important wedge to secure America's future, they are not being allowed to build the capability that will save our country. They are forced to build the legacies of the past, a glorified satellite command, instead of something that truly can defend against what China is building. And what they're building is optimizing the electromagnetic spectrum to make every ship in the ocean a cork. Every aircraft on a, a, an airfield not be able to turn the engine on because the circuit boards are fried because of a very specific tactical electromagnetic spectrum that will put 3,000 volts through every single circuit board and melt them. Once you have the infrastructure in space, you can paralyze any component of our economy, our water system, our logistics, our transportation system, any car built after 2013 that has chips in it that are not hardened. You can paralyze an economy that's dependent on electricity. And you can paralyze the electricity because all of our transformers, again, are not hardened. This is why we stood up uh, the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force when I was the commander of Joint Base San Antonio to show energy companies that there was an affordable way to bring resilient energy that it was impervious to these electromagnetic weapons. But it's a slow road, just like with the industrial complex, the military industrial complex. You know, they build a good plane, and then the lobbyists for that company that built that good plane will not let the government build something different like a series of satellites that could see and kill any airplane that flies above the trees. China's building it, are we? So this gets back to the fact that all those conversations about a strong military and, a, a, and an economy that is powerful mean nothing if we do not get back to the business of teaching our children the values of one nation under God and a constitution that has all of the principles that God has taught us to live our lives by, including free will to choose good and evil, to reveal your heart, independence, self-reliance, and privacy. These are great American traditions that are slipping through our fingers as we speak because we took our eye off the ball of education. We did not do what God told Moses or what Thomas Jefferson told us, and that is, Every generation has to fight for freedom. And if you don't teach your children the values and the beliefs, they will get into policy positions and create policies that are not founded in human nature and the way God created this world. So this is what we are here for. This is what this kind of organization is meant to do. And it is all about logistics. And this is why I moved into the front line of this fight as a CEO of a startup space company because I could not stand on the sideline and wait for the government to build something that they aren't even asking for yet. I know what we need to build, and I'm gonna get the private money of American patriots that understand what this fight is all about and not let Chinese money influence this company. <laughs> but it's not easy because China is everywhere. They've got a lot of money and a lot of people. And they seduce these companies. So many of these space companies are going to go out of business, just like the telecommunications industry. I don't know if you guys remember uh, when Motorola, Nortel, and Lucent Technologies were the big powerhouses back in 1989. Or I'm sorry, 1998. And they all took the bait. They all took the billion dollar finder's fee and the marketplace of China to build all the telecommunication from the ground up. And six years later, they were bankrupt. And Huawei came out of nowhere and dominated 5G, and we were all caught flat-footed. They're doing the same thing with the space industry right now, as well as all those other industries I talked to you about, artificial intelligence, quantum. Now, we still have the most innovative and creative engineers on the planet because they're allowed to talk. Our competitive advantage is that creativity. China's Achilles heel is that they are subordinated. They all have to do what the central party says, and eventually they'll pick the wrong 
they'll pick the wrong idea. But only if American young companies can survive. And it is a fight. It's an economic warfare fight because China doesn't want to shoot a bullet. They want us to go out with a whimper by 2049 and not even have the ability to fire a shot. So this is why I'm here, to remind you of what we talked about a while back and to remind you that it's gotten worse, not better, and that we are in bigger trouble now than we were two years ago, and that we had better get back to the basics of one, teaching our children the values that made us great, and two, investing in our companies in a way that allows them to innovate faster than China. Because if, not, if nothing is done to intervene, China will have a space force so powerful, we won't have time to get up there and bring them down. We need to start today. You can get a hold of me through Jim or Wayne or any of these guys. Jim, I hope you're feeling better wherever you're at. I know he's under the weather again, so say a prayer for him. Mm -hmm.